Hey, good morning or good afternoon. I don't know what time it is. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, final day of Tableau Conference. Uh, probably the final session for a lot of folks in this room. Uh, welcome one and all. Quick uh, super you know, scientific poll. How many people stayed out past uh, 2 a.m. yesterday? Couple of us, us, bear in mind, right? So um, uh, if the voice three, is a little hoarse, and three and four, if the voice is a little hoarse today, there's a good reason why. Um, also, if you happen to catch a little sparkle in my face, it's not you know, my bright eyes, it's more the, uh, the glitter beard hangover from yesterday. Um, also, why I don't have a sports coat on, because it's covered in red glitter. Anyways, uh, enough about my day to night out shenanigans. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Jeremy Blaney. I, am, uh, I lead a team of strategic customer success managers at Tableau whose sole focus it is uh, working with customers to help them maximize the value of their investment in uh, Tableau. I've been here for a couple of years now exclusively within the customer success space. Prior to this, I was in people analytics at Bank of America, and prior to all that, I was in the Air Force for about 10 years. Um, in addition to my Tableau gig, I also have a side gig. I'm a, uh, blah, blah, blah. I'm a lecturer on data analytics and statistical methods at the Fletcher School at Tufts University. Thanks. Uh, my name is Lillian Katz. I've been at Tableau for about two and a half year ne years now. I came from a financial tech startup. I work within enterprise sales here at Tableau, so I have the privilege of working with some of our largest customers, one of which is the United Nations. So I've spent that time really being inspired by what they're doing within the humanitarian space and specifically around data. Um, I also lead our Tableau community grants process out of our DC office, which is a part of our Tableau foundation, where each year we give local nonprofits um, different $5,000 grants to support the work that they're doing in our community, uh, and then also equip them with Tableau licenses and connect them to Tableau volunteers out of the DC office to help them further their data work within their organizations. Uh, so this is our second year giving this talk, and when we sat down uh, earlier to think about the ways that we wanted to revamp for 2019, we started by just throwing out some things that both of us were passionate about. And the thing that we kept coming back to was waste, and specifically single-use plastics. And I told Jeremy the story of a couple of years ago. I was in Cancun, and I was floating in the beautiful, pristine water. And alongside of me are like floating all of these plastic water bottles. Um, and even on the beaches, you know, there were areas where plastic had just washed up on shore, people hadn't even bothered to clean up after themselves, um, which was just really disheartening. And then even earlier in this year when I was in Puerto Rico and talking with some of the volunteer groups there that focused specifically on plastic waste, learning about how on a Saturday they'll go through and they'll clean up all of the macro plastics on the beach, so your water bottles, things of that nature, and then have a second crew of people who come back and actually work section by section on the beach, sifting through the sand to get some of those smaller plastics out, just because of the extraordinary amount of single-use plastics that exist within the world. And so the situation that Lillian's describing, um, and I didn't know where that story was gonna go, so it could have gone south real fast, but the situation that Lillian is describing, it's only gonna get worse. Uh, since about 2010, the uh, amount of macro plastics in the surface ocean has increased by about 40% and is expected to reach about 1.1 million tons by the end of 2019. And yes, that is going to be an annoyance for us beach-going folks and Cancun and Puerto Rico-going folks, all these exotic destinations that you've been to while I stay in DC and uh, love life there. Um, but all these macroplastics are wreaking havoc on maritime life and the ecosystems on which that maritime life relies. So the question is, what do we do about it? Today what we're here to talk to you about is how to make the world a better place through the use of data. Um, each phase of the analytical chain has a part to play here, and what we're going to do just over the next you know, 40 minutes or so is walk you through each piece to give you a sense of how you could use Tableau to drive forward progress on an issue that you care about. 
Our use case today is going to be focused on this triangle that we see everywhere in our lives today, reducing, reusing, and recycling. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't follow the same steps that we walk you through here to make an impact on your community through the use of data on some other issue that you know, you're particularly proud about. I saw some uh, really great organizations on badges just as we were getting set up here. And so, um, yeah, I would encourage you just as we're walking through this to think how it could relate to, uh, to, to what it is that you're doing. In fact, as Lillian and I were presenting or preparing for this presentation, we were kind of you know, bopping around between various causes that we care about and wanted to champion today. I was in the military for a decade, like I said, and so I'm really uh, big on helping veterans figure out how they can transfer uh, their skills from the military to the private sector. Uh, Lillian talked about some of the great initiatives that she supported through uh, the DC crew out there. And, uh, and a lot more. But like I said, the point is really this. The world is not without its challenges. Everybody knows that. And uh, through the use of data and the analytical chain that we're about to walk you through, uh, you have the ability to drive forward progress on any one of those challenges. So let's get started. The first stage of the analytical process is connecting to data. When I was a kid, uh, this was me. After a heavy or a light rain, you know, puddles would form on the street. I don't know what it was about me, but I was like drawn to those puddles. I would step in them, I would splash in them, I would like frolic about in them. It was a ton of fun, but that fun would only last for like 10 minutes. After 10 minutes, my shoes would get wet, my socks would get soaked, you know, my legs would get very dirty, and I'm, you know, sort of a germaphobe like that. All in all, like, I would just stop having fun. And I tend to go through those same emotions when I kick off an analytical project. When somebody comes to me and says, hey, I have a data question, I tend to react in the same way that I think all of you react. Like, I get kind of excited about you know, kicking off the flow, right? I'm thinking about opening that super sexy UI and clicking on some measures and dimensions and dragging them into the canvas, discovering something interesting, bringing over a little bit more, discovering something more, and, uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. I'm also thinking about like all the wonderful visualizations that I could create as a part of that analytical initiative. Am I gonna keep it basic with like a line chart and some bar charts, or am I gonna go like a level deeper and create something like with a bit more pizzazz, like a sunburst chart or a, or a Sankey or something like that? Uh, the point is, is like when somebody comes to me with a data question, I get really, really jazzed up and really excited about the road ahead until I start connecting to some data. Data is problematic in so many different ways, and we've seen a lot of these ways in supporting the United Nations over the past couple of years. Um, here's a snippet of a data set that I downloaded from the World Bank Group, where I was simply looking at GDP over um, a, a span of time, the last 40, 50, 60 years or so. And, um, and you can already notice a few problems there, right? You know, the data doesn't actually begin on row one. We've got a, a, a title and I think a current as of date up there. I would like us all to make a blood pack today to say that we're never gonna do that. Putting metadata in, uh, in your uh, um, metadata, like current as of dates and that kind of thing in your Excel file, I think that's totally cool, but like, please, let's make the blood pack to put it over on its own separate worksheet. Um, <laughs> Other things problematic, for whatever reason, I've got my years across columns, and because I'm looking at like 50, 60 years or so, I'm basically looking at a data set that's you know, 40, 50, 60 columns wide. There are ways to get around this with uh, Tableau Desktop itself. Obviously, we could use Data Interpreter. Um, we could also do the manual stuff, open Excel and do the reshaping right there on the fly. Um, but all that takes time. And like I said, I'm super jazzed up about the, the data question that I've been asked. I don't want to spend the time that it takes to prepare that data for the analysis that I want to get started on that much faster. Also problematic, our data might not even be in one Excel file. Uh, like I said, super passionate about military issues, and I wanted to go and better understand demographics of uh, U.S. military veterans. I went to data.gov, 
uh, you know, search veteran data uh, or something of that nature and thought that I would get one complete data set which would break it down for me state by state by state. Guess what I didn't find? That data set. Instead, I found 50 some out of them, one for Alabama, Arkansas, Alaska, and then so on and so forth. Yes, I can download those files and stitch them together uh, using, um, using uh, Excel manually with a whole lot of copying and pasting. But again, like that takes time and it's not the time uh, that I want to spend doing this kind of thing. And then finally, and this is sort of the most ridiculous thing, uh, data's super messy, right? How many of you have come across a situation like this where you're asking somebody like a pretty basic question, what is your demographic, and you get uh, basically 45 different iterations of that particular thing? I don't know who, I mean, this is a very old use case, I don't know who designed this particular survey, um, but I would love to go back in time, like in my time machine, to say, hey, why don't you just like include a drop down so that way we don't have to uh, deal with correcting basically 15, uh, 150,000 records or so. Um, so yeah, data, data, data is just, it takes a lot of different shapes and forms, and uh, the last thing that I want to do when I'm jazzed about getting started on some sort of analytical initiative, which you know could potentially make the world a better place, is have uh, that excitement tampered by, you know, going through the lift up ahead, which is to get that data ready for some sort of analysis. Um, Open Litter Map is an organization with a super cool mission. Basically, they seek to reduce the amount of litter in the world through crowdsourcing. Um, the idea here is pretty simple. Anybody with a smartphone can capture an image and some associated data points on plastic pollution uh, as they come across it. And those data points might be like the brand of the candy bar wrapper, or if they see a bottle, was it glass, plastic, and so on and so forth. Um, this data can be used in a lot of different ways. Think about it, uh, you know, by mining this data, you could identify hotspots for plastic pollution, which could then inform investments in uh, cleanup efforts. It could also be used to monitor the efficacy of cleanup projects. There are a lot of great initiatives happening around the world where resources, time, money, people are being devoted to cleaning up um, you know, beaches and other, uh, um, you know, environments. And um, it would be super great to be able to mine this data two weeks, three weeks, a month after the fact to uh, say if there's some sort of correlation, there was an increase after the cleanup effort happened uh, because maybe there weren't enough resources devoted against that and they didn't get all the trash or something of that nature. Um, to date, some 102,000 pieces of litter had been identified by thousands of people through Open Litter Map. All of this data is free to use, but individual CSVs need to be downloaded on a per country basis. And maybe that's fine if you're just looking to understand what's going on in the UK or Ireland, but what I want to do is I want to get that global view of the situation at hand. So what do I do? Here I'm going to turn to Tableau Prep. So give me a second as I flip over to Tableau Prep Builder, and here you can see that I'm not connecting to uh, every CSV that's associated um, with every country that uh, uh, data has been collected for through Open Litter Map. Just in the interest of time, I decided to pre-connect to a few of them: USA, Ireland, and uh, and the UK. Um, it's not up there yet. It's on. Can you? Can you flip us to the screen share, my friend? Uh-oh. Thank you. <laughs> oh, maybe I have to get out of presenter view. Just kidding. There we go. I got it. All right. <laughs> Who needs tech checks? All right. So like you can see, I built a very simple flow that's designed to, uh, that's connected to three of those CSVs right now. Like I said, the United States, Ireland, and the UK. And as a first step, you can see that I union two of them together. When I click on that union step, we can see immediately some pretty cool stuff and that there are a couple of mismatch fields. One is uh, called the device step and the other, or excuse me, one is called the device field. It includes some data on what type of device was used to collect this particular information. And then the other field is called phone, which is the exact same thing. It's not uncommon for us to connect to 
you know, seemingly uh, a similar data set and uh, have different fields be named differently between the two of them. But what's great with Tableau Prep Builder is I can simply click on one of these, go down to the end, drag and drop one on top of the next to merge them, and then lo and behold, you know, um, uh, um, I've accomplished a simple task that would have taken me just a heck of a lot longer uh, using some other uh, type of method. Let's go ahead and scoot over to the right, and I'm going to look at this clean step. And at this clean step, you can see that uh, I'm given just a preview of what's in this particular data set. As I scroll to the right, you know, I can see lots of great information on uh, how many, um, you know, there's a lot of smoking information on here, but how many plastic food packagings were discovered and so on and so forth. But as I look to the left, we see a situation that I just described. In that USA file, and I can click on this to denote it a little bit further, but in that USA file, the United States is essentially spelled three different ways throughout. That's going to be problematic when I go to actually visualize this information in Tableau. It's going to give me you know, just some false information or a false sense of what the situation is actually like. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to go ahead and group some of these together using a manual selection. I'm going to select United States of America, and then I'm going to select its associates right down below and click Done. And now, just like that, oh, and we actually have one with the UK. So I'm going to go a level further, and I'm going to do that as well for the UK. And there you go. Now we have our three countries, the UK, Ireland, the United States of America. I didn't have to open up Excel, do a Control V, Control H type of situation to basically copy uh, and replace all of the bad values that are in there. With just a couple of clicks, I was able to quickly do this. One other thing I just love about Tableau Prep, real briefly, is that it gives me the ability to just quickly get a sense of what's going on within this particular data set. So for example, total litter is a, um, uh, a quantitative value, and what it's telling us is when somebody took a picture of, uh, when somebody took a picture of the you know, trash that they came across of while they were on a hike or maybe walking about in their community, they added up how many pieces of litter they saw. Uh, you can see that there are some people that collected some or uh, took a snap of a photo that had 150 pieces of litter included in that. Uh, but by and large, you know, 280, it looks like about 28,000 rows were uh, contained values in sort of the single digits, right? And I think that that is, um, you know, just a really great statistic. And what I'm really hoping is that as people have identified and taken these pictures, that they've also gone the next step, which is actually uh, picking up that trash and, you know, disposing of it properly. So let me flip back over to the Excel here or over to the PowerPoint here. And there we go. So we've all heard the statistic that uh, prepping data requires some 80% of our time. And you know, frankly, that shouldn't be acceptable anywhere, but especially not in situations like this where analytics is being done to drive some sort of positive change in your community. So just in that very brief demo, you saw that with a tool here and a tool there, cleaning and unioning data on the fly and even getting a sense of like what that data set was telling us, I was able to you know, create a flow that reverses that ratio, enabling me to focus on the analytic effort that I want to get started on that much sooner. Cool. Um, so I'm going to pull things into our next step of the process, which is analyzing and exploring an issue. Um, I really recently Marie Kondoed my closet. I don't know Marie Jer Kondo. Jeremy did not know. Is that Marie a con Kondo. is that a is that a coworker? Is that a friend? <laughs> Great friends. We're very close. Um, so if you don't know who Marie Kondo is, she is a professional organizer from Japan. She's a very heartwarming Netflix show. Um, essentially, it's looking at the things you need and the things that spark joy. And if it doesn't hit either one of those things, you take it and you thank it and you send it on its way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, like I did with my glitter beard this morning and, and my super awesome uh, rose neck tattoo, which is 
still uh, still here a little bit. Really so. should have kept I it almost on. convinced my wife that it was permanent really when I FaceTimed her at three in the morning, which she wasn't happy about. <laughs> Anyway, back to me. <laughs> back um, to Lillian and her Marie Kondo effort. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I had this big pile of clothes that I was going to send over to Goodwill. And it, I, I love clothes. And I have amassed um, quite a collection over the years. But I did feel a little physically ill looking at my two big plastic boxes of clothes. Um, and it was sort of perfectly timed with this talk. And I wanted to explore a little bit on um, just what the impact of clothing is, um, particularly when it comes to the section of reuse for our talk. So I started doing a little research on the environmental impact of clothing manufacturing, learning a lot about just the amount of water that it takes even just to um, make a cotton t-shirt through to just the CO2 impact and just the vast amount of textiles that end up in landfills. It's one ton every second. Now some of that is things that we're landfilling ourselves, and then some of that is just what is left over from the textile manufacturing process as well. Um, so I went and I found some data from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and from the Euro Monitor, and I, I brought that into Tableau. Click escape. Escape first. Yep. Let's do this. Um, and so, the first thing I wanted to look at, which was how many clothes, how many garments are we buying per year? And then how does that compare to the amount of times that we're wearing those before they're discarded or donated in some way? So you can see here the blue line is the average number of garments an American buys per year. That's increased about 40% since the beginning of the 90s. Whereas, and we didn't have quite as much data here, the average number of times someone's wearing a garment before they're discarding it is now 32. So this increased about, decreased about 33% over the past 20 years, which is a little shocking. Um, and for fast fashion, so some of the you know, retailers that come to mind, the average is around seven wears before a garment is landfilled or given to a donation center. And so I thought sort of anecdotally, okay, let's look at the next step. I, have, I imagine this has something, again, with fast fashion to do with apparel prices. And so I pulled in information on average retail prices versus average garment prices over the course of the past 30 or so years. And you can see that while apparel prices have re remained relatively flat, average retail price has increased pretty significantly. Um, and this is sort of where I stalled out. And I got a little bit pouty because I couldn't find any more information <laughs> or any more data that really furthered my analysis in the way that I wanted. I was sort of thinking going into this talk that I was going to like do something really groundbreaking, that I was going to like find some data that someone hadn't used in a certain way. And like with my very novice Tableau skills, I was going to like present something or shattering to you. And that just didn't happen. Um, so I took it back to where I started, my own closet, and I thought, okay, how can I just think about what I can do, my own environmental impact, and just become a more conscious consumer? So I made a data set of my own closet, and I'm, you know, we're sharing with the whole, <laughs> all of Data Village here, but I just think this should be a non-judgmental space <laughs> when it comes to the number of garments in my closet. Get out your um, clothes, folks. Especially considering that this was after my Marie Kondo efforts. But we'll get there eventually. Um, so I made a, a, a quick data set in Excel just like having, after having sat in my closet for about two hours, counting everything that I had and deciding what my garment types would be and, and ran it through a prep flow. And what sort of came out of it was garment types, the number of garments I have in my closet, and then on the low end, how long on average in months I think I'm going to keep that garment before either in a case where it's absolutely tattered it goes to the landfill or I'm sick of it and it goes to my younger sisters or to Goodwill. Um, so the first thing I did was I created a calculation um, that did my running sum of waste for my clothing over the next 10 years. And so you can see by 2030, we're at over 1,000 articles of clothing discarded. Now this is in the case that I am replacing Say I have how many dresses? Gosh, 22 a lot. dresses. A lot. The answer's a lot. Uh, every two years, 
and I'm taking those all out of my wardrobe and I'm, I'm buying that same amount, which isn't necessarily, I know, how we all consume clothing, um, but it was the best I could do. Um, so looking at my total waste here, I can see the impact that that has over the next 10 years. And again, this is things either going to Goodwill and sometimes being packaged and shipped overseas, or sometimes going to a textile recycler, but then they find out it's too dirty to use, and so it just ends up landfilled, or it sits in a Goodwill for years and years and years. Um, so I added a parameter here to look at if I can extend the lifetime of my closet by X number of months, how is that going to affect my total waste? So you can see here, if, if I just try, on average, to use my clothes for 12 months longer, a year, how that affects my total waste. Well, maybe. I've done something funky with my calculation here. Let's move on. Um, what I ended up with, because I know that I'm not going to use all of my clothes for the same amount of times. So I'm not going to use socks for the same amount of time that I'm going to keep a dress. I ended up creating parameters for each of the individual garment types within my closet. And so you can see here if I come in, and again, I'm, you know, maybe I try to keep on average all of my dresses for an additional 12 months, how that impacts my cumulative waste over time. And this was an interesting exercise for me, I think, just particularly because I didn't feel like, again, I gave you something groundbreaking, but it did really cause me to question, what are the ways that I'm consuming? Um, what does the impact of that waste look like? And then what are some of the ways that I can start to think a little bit more carefully about how I'm contributing to our environment or the environmental issues that we have? Uh, and so for me, some of that is thinking about more rental clothing options, some of that is thinking about just the durability of my clothes, um, or quite honestly, just not how many times I'm going to wear something, but for how long I might actually keep that thing. Um, so I want to leave you with just a couple of things on this. Um, so I think the first is turn your issue question into a data question even if it means creating your own data set. You know, I think you could use the same exercise from everything from food waste to just the waste in plastics in your bathroom and looking at that impact over time and thinking about some of the ways that you can more consciously consume. Uh, and then also don't be afraid to move in different directions. Um, there were so many more iterations of this than I even showed you today. Um, and so iterate, 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 and I think more than anything, have fun. I don't think I have this problem. I'm thinking uh, back to my bedroom where I keep, I like socks, I have a lot of socks and I never throw away socks. So I have like three drawers in the dresser full of socks and it's like a never ending source of frustration between my wife and I. Um, but thanks Lillian. Uh, so the final stage of the journey is data driven advocacy. Uh, I love this time of the year, uh, not necessarily in Las Vegas, but in Washington DC where Lily and I are both from, uh, because it's perfect for a fire in my backyard. You know, there's a little nip in the air, we light a fire, you know, sit on the couch thing that we have out there and just kind of relax my wife and I and dog. It's absolutely love this time of the year because of that. Uh, creating a fire, I don't think is all that difficult. Uh, it's not super complicated. You just need a few ingredients, some wood, kindling, paper, if I'm super impatient, maybe uh, a lot or a little bit of lighter fluid to get it going a little bit faster, and, uh, and eventually a spark, right? Uh, keeping the fire going, however, is something that's altogether different. You have to poke and prod the wood from time to time. If you find that you know, a log is sort of dying out, then you need to add another to just keep the flame burning uh, throughout the night. I, um, I don't know, maybe I'm a little bit of a pyrotechnic because I just sit there and I tend to like poke and prod the log like nonstop, uh, which is another source of frustration between my wife and I because then she's worried that I'm gonna send up an amber and it's gonna burn down the house one day. Knock on wood, it's never happened. Uh, but I tend to think about you know a great dashboard or a great analytics initiative in the same way. We definitely all have the skill sets to iterate through data and uh, discover insights uh, in, in doing so. And hopefully throughout the week, you've developed a couple of new skills that are going to you know, better enable you to create some really amazing visualizations and some super functional dashboards. But if we don't share those products that we've created, if we don't share those dashboards with anybody, then you know, sort of what's the point? The fire 
is going to die, and the cause that you're advocating on behalf of will be no better off than, uh, than before. Uh, each and every day, we're confronted with asks to recycle. As you've walked throughout the conference center this week, um, I'm sure you've seen the, uh, the triangle written on several, uh, uh, several of you know, bins uh, throughout the hall and such. And I think it's a really good thing that we're constantly confronted with that reminder because it keeps recycling at the top of our minds. Uh, a lot of metros have invested significantly in recycling, and I was really curious to see if and how those efforts were succeeding. And so what I did is I logged on to New York City's Open Data Site, which is a really fantastic resource, and I found some data sets on material that had been collected by the New York City Department of Sanitation in the five, uh, in the five boroughs. And I'm going to flip over to the my Tableau online site so I can share this with you. Let's go ahead and move this into full screen here. I think it's a very large image of myself. <laughs> so here on this dashboard, you can see um, what I'll do is I'll kind of orient you to the dashboard and then I'll talk about this in terms of like data-driven advocacy. But immediately you can see that in October, uh, some 64,000 tons of material were collected by the New York City Department of Tran uh, Trans uh, Sanitation, excuse me. Uh, to the uh, immediately below that, I went ahead and I broke that number down by how many were recyclables and how many were non-recyclables. And you know we can see something that isn't so surprising, which is uh, the non-recyclables obviously outweigh all of the recyclables, 80% uh, to about 20% or so. Down below that, I broke it down a little bit further, giving a sense of, of those recyclables. Was it paper, was it metal glass plastic, or was it organic waste? Below each big figure, I included a, um, a quick little line chart that just gave a sense of the trend over time. And I'm not sure, uh, how well it's represented on the screen, but there is an average line on each of these. And what you can see, if it were resoluting on the screen, is that um, on the recycling side, across the 12 month look back, we're actually below average over the previous few months. And that's, you know, and that's a little concerning. As you look to the right, I went ahead and plotted all of this on a map by connecting to a, uh, a shape file of the New York boroughs and leveraged a parameter. Um, who's excited for dynamic parameters, by the way? I know I would have appreciated that when I was back at Bank of America. Um, but I created a parameter that gives the user the ability to view um, uh, sort of the spectrum of how many people are recycling or not broken down by either all recyclables or you know, perhaps you want to just view paper or so on and, uh, and so forth. So this is the dashboard that I created. Now, as it relates to advocacy, and I'm just going to go out of full screen here for a second, um, Tableau Server and the associated products like Tableau Online and, uh, and especially Tableau Public can be used in a lot of different ways, the first and foremost of which is just getting the word out. Throughout the United Nations, we see a lot of organizations publishing dashboards to um, Tableau Public because it's a free resource and they want to uh, share the many ways in which um, uh, data is being used to uh, you know, basically make their missions more efficient and effective. We see a lot for the, um, the Organization for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs and other organizations beyond that. Um, if you're leveraging a Tableau server with a core-based model, guest user access is also something that you could do to then take that visualization and embed it within you know, your website. So again, you're continuing to get the word out about whatever it is uh, that you are uh, championing as a cause. The other part, uh, as it relates to advocacy, is just recognizing that you know, you're not the only individual who has value to add when conducting an analysis on this particular uh, topic. So let's say that I wanted to dig into one of the boroughs, uh, like Brooklyn 01, and when I click on that, you can see that the uh, rest of the information throughout the dashboard filters. Um, I see a lot of variability sort of throughout, but especially metal glass plastic. 
And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the commenting feature to, um, you know, draw somebody's attention to that. As you can see, I sort of draw attention to it myself uh, through a Manhattan borough. So I'll just, you know, type a quick comment uh, just in the sake of time. Maybe click the icon down below it so that way um, uh, we can bring in a screenshot of exactly what I was referring to. Click post and then lo and behold. And now as I unselect and return my dashboard back to its default state, I can click the view on that icon and it's going to revert back to the visualization or the view, excuse me, that I had just created. So that way as the next person goes there, sees my comment, they're not having to pick up from scratch or just sort of like guess what I was referring to. They can see immediately what I was referring to. Uh, the third part that I just want to draw people's attention to is data-driven alerts. Um, if I, uh, you know, decided to take up recycling as a cause as it related to New York City specifically, you know, I have a full-time job. Chances are I'm not going to be logging into this every single day to see, you know, how this number is progressing month over month over month. Instead, what I can do is click on this axis and um, set up a data-driven alert to inform me any time, let's say, it drops below, I don't know, 18%. So I'm going to select create below or equal to, and I'm going to type in 18%. It's showing me uh, to the left-hand side here uh, the area in which once that line falls will trigger a data-driven alert. I'm going to change this to, um, yeah, we'll just leave it at daily as most, and then click create alert, and then that is that. I can also do some other things like set up subscriptions where, you know, this dashboard is going to be, you know, sent to me on a daily basis so that way I can see what the latest uh, status is on recycling within the New York Metro. And flip back to the Excel, or excuse me, I keep saying the Excel, the PowerPoint here. Um, but there you have it, really simply, Tableau Server and its associated products, like I said, Tableau Online and Tableau Public, they helped us keep the fire alive. You know, you can use guest user access and Tableau Public specifically uh, to get your visits out into the hands of all of those who, you know, want to help out with your causes. That helps you both present your views in a distinctly data-driven way, which is very important, but also to advocate for the issues that you care about. Uh, we can also leverage the commentary uh, to talk uh, and to take the conversation a level deeper. Again, I don't pretend to have all the answers. I'm sure I discovered a couple of insights as I was building this particular dashboard, but what I really want to do is I want to harness the power of the community and the collaborative power of Tableau Server to see if and how we can all come out better uh, from that. And then finally, we can use features like data-driven alerts and subscriptions to stay on top of the issues that we care about. Like I said, I don't have time to log in each and every day and see what these numbers look like, um, but I can simply set up a subscription or something of that nature so that I can jump in and uh, uh, really dig in and figure out what's going on when I see this regressing uh, into a state that you know, is frankly not a, not a good state. All right, so we want to leave you with what you can do from here. You know, our goal today was, I think more than anything else, to inspire you on a whole host of different levels on how you might be able to get involved in the do-good space. Um, Jeremy and I mentioned earlier that we've both um, supported the United Nations during our time at Tableau. And, um, you may have heard of the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. Um, if you haven't, they're essentially the UN's blueprint to achieve a better world. So addressing things like poverty and inequality, environmental issues, et cetera. But what you might not know is that within each of these SDGs, all 17 of them, there are sub-targets and sub-indicators within each of those. And they're a really good place to go and get inspired um, through different data threat sets, through different indicators, to then take this work back um, in what you're doing within your own communities, in your own space, or even just what you're doing individually. Beyond this, there's three other ways that are really a tangible way to get involved in this do-good community within the Tableau space. So the first is the Tableau Service Corps, which is essentially a, a volunteer network of 
Tableau experts who help nonprofits during one-on-one -on -one sessions to design and build a data strategy through to dashboards that they might put out um, on their website or even just use internally. Um, the next is Viz for Social Good, which is um, a sort of community-led effort where everyone's creating visualizations based on um, a project that a nonprofit puts out into that space, and everyone creates something on Tableau Public, um, puts a link to it on Twitter, hashtag this for social good, and then that organization actually goes and reviews those submissions, and then will end up using some of those um, for their own work. And then lastly, um, if you're someone like me that's more of a novice Tableau user and certainly couldn't join the service core, um, but you're interested in just putting your own work out into that space, I would encourage you to use Tableau Public um, and just build up a portfolio of work and start putting things out there and start um, having a conversations with other people. I mean, you saw during um, the d earlier in the week when we talked about the changes to Tableau Public and the editing and the iterating you can do right from within Tableau Public. I think that's an interesting way for us specifically in the good do, do good space to continue to work on issues that have that we know we have data for and that someone started. So, with that said. Um, we encourage you to leave us some feedback on um, the mobile app, uh, and then we'll leave some time for questions if you'd like to come up to the front. But um, I hope you've enjoyed this, and thank you so much for taking some time out of your uh, last day at TC to come and hear us. Thank you.